what is forbidden in the third commandment. The third commandment forbiddeth all profaning or abusing of anything whereby God maketh himself known. Question 55 of the Shorter Catechism. We looked at what the third commandment requires of us, and now we turn to what is forbidden in the third commandment. So the third commandment is prohibiting uh, the taking of God's name in vain. We looked at how there's a positive side and a negative side. It means that we're to treat with reverence uh, everything that uh, is attached to the Lord. So when we refer to his name, we mean anything whereby God makes himself known to us. So that would be forbidding the profane or abusing of any of these things, God's name, his titles, his attributes, his works, his word, his ordinances, and so on. And when I say profane, profaning or abusing, I mean rashness, you, you know, being rash in how we handle these things, or irreverent, or acting in a way that is unbecoming. The word, the word profane actually comes from the Latin and it means before the temple. And that's where we get our, our English word. So it, it conveys this idea of disrespect, irreverence, contempt, or desecrating something that is sacred. And so we will highlight uh, a handful of ways in which uh, God's name is profaned or abused. Uh, the most obvious one the first one on our list would be uh, blasphemy. Blasphemy is an overt violation of the third commandment. So if in the sixth commandment, killing someone unlawfully is the obvious thing that's being prohibited on the surface, blasphemy would be the equivalent in the third commandment. In fact, this is such a serious, such a wicked sin that under the Old Testament, as you'll see in Leviticus 24 and verse 16, it required the death penalty. So just as murder and adultery required the death penalty, so did open public uh, blasphemy. Blasphemy is speaking reproachfully or uh, revilingly uh, of God. So speaking in a reproachful or reviling manner of God himself, it's a direct attack on who God himself is. And this is the greatest affront uh, done to him uh, by his creatures. You look at Exodus chapter 5 and verse 2 for uh, some, uh, an example of that. It's the greatest affront done to him by, by creatures. So people obviously who hate the Lord they can't get their hands on him. So God is not physical. He doesn't have a body like men. They can't kill God. They can't physically attack him. And because they can't attack him with their hand, they will use the only thing left, which is their mouth. So it's a, a way of, of seeking to attack God through our mouths. So that is obviously prohibited. Uh, a second example, would be perjury. Perjury is another example of this. So this is, we talked in our last class about solemn oaths and solemn vows, these ordinances in which God is invoked as a witness or as a party to a covenantal engagement. We're to do this with reverence, we're to do it thoughtfully, we're to do it meaningfully and sincerely and so on. Well, we can also do the opposite. There can be a breach of solemn oaths or, or vows. That would include lying, asserting something that is false in a vow or in an oath. Or it could be entering into an oath or vow with uncertainty. So we're not wholeheartedly engaging in this, this bond, but rather there's a measure of uncertainty. Uh, we can also um, do the same thing by breaking the engagements. So we've taken vows or oaths to do certain things. When we break those, we are breaking 
uh, we're being covenant breakers and we're taking God's name in vain. And so this would be uh, impeaching the omniscience of, of God uh, himself. It's a flagrant disregard for the fact that God sees all things. Thou, God, seest me, and that all things are open and naked before him. And we're acting as if that's not the case. We're dismissing it as if the Lord didn't know and uh, was not aware of what we were doing. A third thing, which is again uh, obvious, would be sinful cursing. Sinful cursing. Uh, this is um, something that invokes God's, God's wrath. God's wrath is, is being um, aroused whenever we engage in sinful cursing either to the Lord uh, and about the Lord or to other people. So, for example, if we uh, use some of God's names and attributes in this way, when a person takes God's name in vain, uh, they, they, as an exclamation, you know, use the name Jesus Christ, or they, you know, cry out, um, oh my God, not in prayer and in humility and reverence, but as a, an exclamation, a surprise, or, or something that they're upset about. This is a way of, of doing that. When people use the word damn, D-A-M-N, that's an appropriate word. The Lord damns the wicked, and there is eternal damnation that is reserved for the devil and his angels. But we're referring to a work of God there, God's judgment and punishment on uh, uh, people or, or, or angels, or perhaps even nations and people or whatever. And so when people speak flippantly and use that word and, and will speak about God damning something, they are breaking God's third commandment, right? If they were doing it reverently, they would actually be calling upon God to damn something to hell. But that's not what they're doing. They're using it trivial in a trivial manner, and that's a problem. When people speak about hell and use that as a, a curse word, it's the same thing. Where, you know, this is something that God has created and reserved for the punishment of sin and sinners. It's not, it's not uh, a light matter. It's not a casual matter. It's not something that's to be spoken of um, in flippant ways. It's to bring fear to us and, and to, to cause us to, to come reverently before the Lord. And so it's impudent and it's presumptuous as if God is to be called upon like a lackey when people invoke his name or they refer to damnation or they refer to hell in these ways as if God is bound to empty his wrath on our whim because of something that irritates us or bothers us. These, this is all sinful forms of, of, of cursing. Another would be <clears throat> um, various forms of uh, sinful swearing. So now we're not talking about swearing an oath, which can be done biblically, but sinful uh, swearing. And this would include uh, using God's name in ordinary conversation. So I, I, I mentioned in a previous class, people will take the, the attributes of God and they will say, you know, holy cow. They're taking uh, an attribute of God and uh, attributing it to, you know, a cow. This is a this is a sinful way of, of swearing. They're taking God's name, his attributes, his works, and then just casually sprinkling, sprinkling them into ordinary conversation with little or no reflection about it. And although this is extremely common, uh, it being common desensitizes us to what is biblical, what, what actually is near and dear uh, to, to God's glory. And so, 
we think of abortion, 3,000 babies being killed a day. People can become desensitized to the fact this is horrific. This is genocide. I mean, we are, we are mutilating, torturing, and destroying uh, unborn babies in mass as, as a nation. Well, s similarly, and perhaps less, uh, more imperceptibly, there are people who just hear this language being used and their conscience has become cold and not sensitive to the fact that we're talking about the Lord here. If they're walking God consciously in the fear of the Lord, sense of his presence, then there's going to be a sensitivity to it. Another thing would be the common use of the phrase, I promise. So children, this may be something that you hear people do or do yourself. You know, children will be talking among themselves and they'll say, I did this. No, I did this. And there's an argument, say, I promise. You know, I promise. Or something they're going to do. If you do this for me, then I'll do it. I promise I will. Right? We're, we're taking, we're, we're making um, use of an ordinance, a promissory oath, and we're using it just in a casual, irreverent, trivial way. We're just saying it mindlessly. It's a, it's a mindless oath. I promise I'll do this. No. When we actually promise something, we're entering into a solemn engagement. It needs to be reflective. It needs to be reverent. It needs to be purposeful. It needs to be in a sense of God's presence and so on. In the normal course of our life, the Bible says, let your yea be yea and your no, no. So in the old days, in a previous generation, a man's bond was his, his word. And so when, when you say, I'm going to do something, that's good enough. You know, you should be able to stand by your word without anything else being added to it. Or, I didn't do this. Well, your word should be good enough. To add to it a promissory oath is something sober and should be reserved for occasions that, uh, that warrant it. Uh, another thing would be our outward, the Christian's outward walk. So here we're getting to the spiritual nature of the, the commandment. This is not one that people would think about, but we are, the Bible says, called by God's name. The Christian is called by God's name. And we've made a profession of faith. And therefore, that profession is to be without hypocrisy. When a Christian does something scandalous, it's actually, in addition to the sin itself, it's also a violation of the third commandment because we are walking disorderly. We bear the name of God and we are uh, engaging in things that displease him. Another thing would be with regards to his ordinances. The ordinances of worship. Uh, the ordinances of church government or of church discipline and so on. So we can, we can violate this commandment by neglecting the ordinances. We're not giving ourselves to family worship, secret prayer, attending the public assembly of God's, uh, God's people. Neglecting that would be a violation of the third commandment. So would uh, going through the ordinances superficially that is to say, without seeking God in them. So if we're just going through the motions in this empty, formal routine, and we're not actually seeking the Lord in the ordinances, we're violating the third commandment. It's irreverent use of his ordinances. Uh, two more. Uh, one would be his word, and the last one would be his works. So we're tying all of the things that we discussed earlier uh, together here. With regards to his word, you can look at the larger catechism, question 113, um, uh, to see more on this. But misinterpreting God's word, violation of the third commandment, misapplying it, making jokes about God's word. So I would say, as a general rule, religious jokes are inappropriate. So if we're, if we're talking about God's word and then there's levity, there's, you know, we're trying to make it humorous or something, that's an that's a irreverent way of handling God's word, one of the ways that he re re reveals himself to us. Uh, unprofitable quibbles about God's word, <clears throat> holding to or teaching false doctrine, and so on. These would all be examples of what is prohibited. With regards to his works, you know, we can think of creation, providence, 
and uh, redemption. And there are uh, many ways in which this can take place. We can be lusting after things that God hasn't given to us. Well, that's a violation of the 10th commandment. Could be the 7th commandment. Also, uh, the 3rd commandment, being unthankful with what God has given to us in his providence and creation or murmuring about these things. Remember the words in Numbers 14, verses 2, and then in verse 28, would to God. Well, there's occasions in which that would be inappropriate when we're actually uh, resisting uh, the work that God has, has done. And it's also true, of course, of thinking or speaking about God's work. So his creation, his providence, uh, redemption. We need to be handling all of these things reverently, reflectively, uh, in ways that honor and, and please him. So question 55, what is forbidden in the third commandment? The third commandment forbiddeth all profaning and abusing of anything whereby God maketh himself known.